you know, just so I know some people are newer to the church, um, we, we take seriously that God is great. And that's why you'll notice the subtle thing we do is every time we preach, we start by reading the Word of God before we launch into my, my sermon. Because, um, Lord willing, you will hear God through the sermon. Lord willing, you will hear God through the music. But we are certain you will hear God through His Word. And for that reason, we honor the Word. We lift it up. It is holy. It is good. It is not to be confused. I've had lots of conversations lately about the Word of God with people, which is great. Um, the Word is the Bible, but it's not. The Word is Jesus. We know that. But the physical written Word is the only way by which we see Christ. Because if we don't have something that tells us what Jesus is like, then how do we claim to know who Jesus is? Otherwise, we're just saying it's what I feel he's like. I feel he would forgive my sin. I feel he would do this. Um, so without a standard, without an authority, we have no Christianity. And so we believe the Word of God, the Bible, to be authoritative, perfect, infallible in what it purports to teach. And if you have any questions about what that means, come to our classes, talk to me anytime. But let me read, we're starting our series in, in the book of Acts. So we're going to read chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of, God, kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, which, sorry, which he said, you heard from me, for John the Baptist, sorry, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of God. Okay, so, the book of Acts. So the book of Acts, let's start very simply. It is a sequel to Luke the Gospel of Luke. It's, I won't go into all the details, but we have very good reason to believe a guy named Luke wrote these two books. And we know he wrote them, well, first, that's 25% of the New Testament. That's a lot. And we know that he wrote them with intentionality because he says so. He starts Luke in a certain way. He ends it in a certain way. And then as he starts the book of Acts, he starts by making clear what the first volume was about and now what the second volume is about. So the first one, he tells us, dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach up until when he ascended. And then, here in the book of Acts, he picks up at the ascension, and he says, now we're going to start in a different direction, but the same. Because if the first book showed what Jesus taught and did while he was on earth in his ministry, the second book of Acts shows what he continues to do from heaven. Because make no mistake, and this is one of the questions community groups will be talking about this week, the book of Acts is sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles, which can be a little misleading because it's not merely the Acts of men. It's the Acts of the Sovereign God sitting at Jesus, the Lord of all creation, sitting at the right hand of the Father, orchestrating his plan for the world through his Holy Spirit by his church. And so who's the Acts of? A lot of things. The Acts of Jesus, the Acts of the Father, the Acts of the Spirit, the Acts of the Church, a lot of Acts happening. So maybe just call it Acts probably easier. And this is what the book is about. And here, at the outset, it's important that he says it's 40 days. See, he outlines in these first 11 verses, Luke says, here's what Jesus did. When he was raised from the dead, he spent 40 days with his apostles, well, his disciples, the followers. After they are, they, the Spirit comes upon them, then they become apostles, sent ones. But for now, here they are as disciples. And he spends 40 days with them, and then he ascends. Now, the word, the number 40 days should be uh, striking some bells if you're a Christian. Because back in Exodus 34, Moses spends 40 days sitting at the mountain with God receiving the law. 
And so, when we now hear that Jesus spends 40 days with the disciples, and he is telling them, as Luke says, about the kingdom of God, we're seeing an intentional overlap here, a recapitulation, a re-beginning in some ways. That what happened at Mount Sinai was Israel was given the law of how to, how to live before God. And now, but just before the ascension, the disciples are being given the law, the kingdom, the, what the, king, the description of the kingdom, and how to live for God. And this is why it's 40 days. It's a new downloading of the law, as it were, of this new kingdom that he is ushering in. And so when we look at this very clearly, what we see is Jesus, it's so, it's so important for us, because here at Redeemer especially, and, and I spend a lot of times in my own head trying to figure out, what does Acts tell us to do? And I'll say this, and it's going to become embarrassingly obvious. It is unrelenting in telling us that we are called to reach people with the gospel. Mission, 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 mission. It's going to beat us over the head every week for 40 weeks. And there's no way around it. And as we look at this, it begins here with Jesus telling us, okay, here's what you need to know as a church. And not just what you need to know, but here's what you need to do, and then here's how you can actually do it. Okay? So he's going to tell us here what we need to know, what we need to do, and then how we can actually accomplish the mission he has given us. So, what do we need to know? Well, it's pretty simple, the kingdom. But, but here's what's interesting about this passage. Everything revolves around verse 6. That little statement, that question that the disciples ask, which we mock, as pastors for centuries have mocked the disciples, and we said, what a stupid question. Uh, we've been a little bit hard on the disciples here. Uh, when, when, the, when he asked, they asked the question, Lord, will, at, this, at this time, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? That's an important question. And yes, there are errors in that question. Yes, there's errors and misunderstanding in the disciples' thinking. But it's a very logical question. And to see, understand that first, let me help you understand why the disciples asked that question in the first place, because it's important. And here's where I'm going to give a small history lesson. Um, you've probably heard this term, but you probably have not studied it much. Not Alexander, you know who he is. But the Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabean Revolt is this thing that happens. So after Alexander, you put Alexander back up there. So after Alexander the Great dies, so remember, Israel has not been unified and free since 950 BC, arguably, for 800 years to this point. And they, after Solomon, the kingdom splits under Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So they're not unified. Then comes Assyria, then comes Babylon, then comes Persia, then comes the Greeks, then come the Romans. So here we have, as of 322, 323, Alexander dies. And when Alexander the Great dies, and he has the, mass, the biggest kingdom ever created to that point in history, that stretches all the way to India, he then, uh, like King Lear, divides his kingdom up. And a bunch, four different generals take a chunk of the kingdom. And Israel falls into the eastern kingdom that is called the Seleucid dynasty, or the Seleucid Empire. And that empire reigns for a couple hundred years, and it's a Greek empire. And around uh, and 167 is when the trouble begins in Israel. And there's a king named Antiochus IV, also called Epiphanes. Epiphanes means uh, God manifest. The Jews would call him Epimanes, which means crazy man. Um, <laughs> but, so Epiphanes, uh, sorry, Antiochus, he's, he's this king who is Greek, and he loves Greek culture. He loves the culture. He wants Israel to, and not just Israel, the whole kingdom, because remember, he's a Greek who is running a kingdom that stretches from Turkey all the way east towards India. So this is not a Greek people he's overseeing, but he wants them to become Greek. And many of the people want to become Greek, just like most countries today want to be America. We want to consume their culture. And so he starts to, he, he's, a, he's what they call a Hellenist. Hellas meaning Greek, uh, Greece and Greek. And so a Hellenist is a person who wants to absorb Greek culture. And he does this all over the kingdom. But he runs into a problem. Antiochus loses a bunch of wars. So he has a massive amount of debt, and he needs money. So he decides to break a rule that most Seleucid kings would never have broke, which is he gets involved in local politics. Normally, these kings would let uh, nations have their own religious freedom because it kept the peace. Just keep the taxes coming in. That's all that matters. But he needs money. So he decides to get involved in a local problem in Israel. And Israel, who has no power of their own, has only one position that you can rise to of, stand of status, and that's the high priest. And here, two factions, surprise, surprise, liberal and conservative, are putting forward candidates. And 
and Antiochus decides, I'm going to get involved because the liberals, who were the guys who wanted to get rid of everything Jewish and bring in Greek culture, say, hey, Antiochus, if you support our candidate named Menelaus, if you support him, we will fund and we'll pay for your debts. We'll just raid the temple because we don't need it anymore because we're not Jews. We want to be Greeks. And so he gets involved. But before that is even settled, he decides any he's going to go to the temple. He, just, he, he ransacks it, takes all the money from it, he uh, dedicates it to Zeus. He bans all Jewish practices, so you can no longer have circumcisions. You can't have um, uh, you can't have practice the Sabbath. There's no sacrificial system. Everything is gone, which obviously angers Israel, all the Jews. And as he's doing this, when it trickles down to the local level, a guy named Mattathias. He's in a place called Modi'in, a little city, and he's a priest. And he decides, um, I am not going to put up with this. Because his local official says, Mattathias, you all, every household must sacrifice a pig to, to the Greek gods. And the pigs are an unclean animal to the Jews. So Mattathias not only resists, but he kills his servant when the servant tries to do it. And then he goes and finds the official who wants him to do it, and he kills him too. Then what happens? Well, the Seleucids say, well, we've got to send somebody to deal with Mattathias. So they send a small group of people. Mattathias then takes his five sons, including Judah, Judah Maccabee, and they disappear into the wilderness. And they begin a guerrilla war against the Seleucid dynasty that lasts from 167 to 160 BC. Long story short, Judah eventually, Judah Maccabee, takes the temple back, rededicates it, reinstitutes worship, and at one point he is looking for oil to start the menorah again, and he only finds one day's worth of oil, and yet that oil miraculously survives for eight days. And then we have Hanukkah. In fact, Hanukkah means dedication. So that's the story. Now, why am I telling you this history? Why bother telling you this? Well, this is why. When a seismic event occurs to a people and to a nation, it not only impacts them, but it causes us, all of us have done it, to reinterpret things through that event. You begin to see the world through traumatic events. Who hasn't? I mean, we're fortunate. We live in a pretty peaceful time. Most of us have not suffered through massive wars. What's the biggest event? JFK, if you were alive in the 60s, is that a big thing? Is it the Cuban Missile Crisis? Is it um, the Space Shuttle Challenger? Is it 9-11? Is it the hundreds of school shootings? I don't know. COVID, that's a pretty big one. And you begin to reinterpret and reinvent things through the event. And in this period between the last prophet, Malachi, and the New Testament in Christ, Israel starts to rethink. They say, well, what is the... What, is, what do the prophets actually say about the Messiah and about the kingdom he's going to bring and about the spirit that's supposed to be poured out when the Messiah comes? What's, what is this all about? And they start to see it through the Maccabean lens because the Maccabean revolution gave them a glimpse of what things might look like if we could finally sweep the Gentiles away, if we could finally be at peace and have freedom again, this is what it might look like. And so they start to expect a kingdom and a Messiah to come that looks like Judah Maccabee. And so when the disciples then turn and say to Jesus, okay, is it now? Is it now you're going to bring the kingdom and restore it to Israel? You have to understand it's not a stupid question. It's a quite logical question, actually. Now, just because it's logical doesn't mean it is um, right, because it is not. But George Ladd, a New Testament scholar, says this about the way the Jews thought. To the Jews, the Messiah was expected to be either a conquering Davidic king before whom his en the enemies of God and of God's people could not stand, or he would be a heavenly supernatural being who would come to earth with power and great glory to destroy the wicked and to bring the kingdom of God in power. In either case, the coming of the Messiah would mean the end of this age and the appearance of the kingdom in power. And so... With that, they ask the question, is it now? Is it now? You're ascending. Is it now that the kingdom's going to come? And Jesus' response is fascinating. But to understand, before we go into this response, we have to ask the question, what is this kingdom? What was it that Israel was waiting for? And what does Jesus say it actually is? What is the kingdom of God? What, is, what was it that occupied his 40 days of teaching, according to Luke? It's the kingdom. So what is that? Um, there's a scholar named Patrick Schreiner, uh, Schreiner who is, um, this statement of this kingdom is used pretty much by everybody now. He's a pretty young guy, so I don't know why he's become so influential so quickly, but it's pretty good. This statement is, tells you what the kingdom is. The kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. And that's pretty standard. Most scholars will now say that's kind of a good definition because 
The kingdom of God is a statement about who God is. The kingdom of God suggests that God is king, irregardless of your feelings. This is why I have a bee in my bonnet sometimes about things. And one of them is when somebody says, make Jesus Lord of your life. I'm sorry, you don't make Jesus Lord of anything. He is Lord. You accept his lordship, but you don't make him Lord. You don't have that power. He is king, irregardless of what you see in the world. And yet, because the world is sinful, you see a resistance to that lordship and to that kingship. And so that ends up with peace being fractured. So you see the world we have now, not because Christ isn't enthroned, but because his lordship is not acknowledged at the moment. So where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is that place where his power and his kingship is recognized and modeled here. It ought to be here, in our hearts, individually and corporately. You as an individual ought to be a vessel, a symbol, a foretaste of the past resurrection and a, and, a, and a foretaste of, or sorry, a taste of the past resurrection and a foretaste of the coming resurrection. This church, our family should look different than the world because we live as if Christ was king because he is. The rest of the world lives as if somebody else is king. Themselves right now is probably the dominant idol in our culture. And so that is where the king is there. That's why when Christ shows up, he says, the kingdom is in your midst, it's here. And so we have we ought to be a taste of the kingdom here. We live as if Christ is Lord because we believe he is Lord in our hearts. We know him to be that. And so when we then look at Jesus, what does he say about it? It helps. And I can only do it very quickly here because it's obviously a big topic. But when we look at what Jesus says specifically about the kingdom, we see first it's entered into by repentance. You don't get in by your good works. You don't get in because you tithe a certain amount or because you've been a nice parent or because you have voted for the right person or because you, well, anything other than Christ. In fact, Acts 4.12 says there's no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved. And that will, of course, make us very, um, put us at odds with the culture because we say there's no other way to heaven. No other religion tells you the truth about God but Christianity. And that sounds so exclusive. But I'll just offer this as a small apologetic. When you tell me that's not true, you're telling me that your view is the right one and not mine, so you're just as exclusive as I am. So there it is. The kingdom is entered to by repentance. It is distinct from the kingdom of the world, and this is hard for us Christians because it means there's times when you are going to be asked to live a certain way by God, and when you're not, the faithful people of God that you trust, your leaders and your friends and your family, need to tell you you're not living right. Because the kingdom of the world is different than the kingdom of God. So it's distinct. Different rules, different values, a different king. It is spiritual and not observable. And this is seismic for the, 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 the disciples. Because when they say, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? What they're asking for is, when are we going to have power again? When are we, and listen, a lot of Christians are saying this now. Let's get back at the government, right? They're taking our rights. They're persecuting us. We need power again. Boy, that's a... That's a that's not a good thing to say. We do not, not, that's the way the world understands power. God, Christ comes and says, you're going to receive a spiritual power. And that is completely different than what the disciples were expecting. So it's a radical check on their, their theology. It's not observable. Uh, third, the king, or fourth, I don't know. The kingdom is the invasion of earth by the spirit and by heaven. We do not build the kingdom. Now, I know people say, but I do. I do things. I help God. I, I, I implement his vision. I agree, but the bricklayer doesn't build the cathedral. He may put the brick there, but he's following a blueprint and a command and a practice given to him by the one who made it. And Christ sits at the right hand of God, orchestrating the work of the spirit and the building of his kingdom. The king builds the kingdom, not us. And it's an invasion. When every time we pray in the Lord's Prayer, let, uh, 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 let be done on heaven as it is uh, on heaven. Is there to, the kingdom of God on earth is in heaven. Thank you. I've, I've recited it every day for three years at our last church, and I forgot it. What you're calling for is for an invasion of the, the kingdom to come here and to transform this one, which is radical. And that's what the kingdom is. It's an invasion of earth. Citizens respond in gratitude. There's a beautiful line. Read it in Hebrews 12. It says, out of gratitude. Out of gratitude, the, 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 the citizens of the kingdom obey the laws of the kingdom. Not because we have to, but because we want to. It's that wonderful old William Cowper line you've heard me say. To see the law by Christ fulfilled and to hear his pardoning voice transforms a slave into a child and duty into choice. When you see what Christ has done for you, it's no longer a burden to obey, but it's a joy to obey. It's one of the signs you know you're a Christian. 
is when you start finding it enjoyable to obey and not just a burden. Lastly, the kingdom is here, but not yet fully. And this is all over the New Testament. He is king here, but the world does not recognize his kingship. But what are we told all through Revelation? One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so we come and we live as if he is king because he is king. But one day he will come in fullness and everyone and everything will acknowledge his kingship. That's the kingdom of God, put very simply. Now, that's what we need to know. If you don't know what the kingdom of God is, who's building it, what it's, what it's supposed to look like, if you're not constantly holding up what you do to this perfect example, you're going to start building something different. And so it begins with Christ saying, before I send you out to do the work, you need to know what it is I'm asking you to do. And that's the first part. What you need to know is what the kingdom of God is. Much more to be said, but that's a start. Second thing, what do we need to do? Now, in, in, Jesus's quest, in the question the disciples give, are you now going to bring the kingdom? Are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? There's at least three problems with this passage. And two of them I'm going to address right now. One I just did about the power issue. But the first thing is, Lord, will you at this time restore? And Jesus jumps immediately in, and so do the angels, about the question of timing. Because they're under the impression that right now is going to happen. And it's not that that's a bad question. It's not bad to ask, when is this going to happen? The bad thing is it's a distraction at times. That you can be distracted by the timing and fall in two different directions, either overemphasizing or de-emphasizing it. And so when they ask, is it now? Jesus' first response is, it's not your business to know what, when it's happening. And then the, disciple, or the angels say the exact same thing when they say, what are you standing here looking up to heaven for? Why are you wasting? Like, that's not the goal of this. And there's at least three reasons why you and I don't need to worry about the time and dates, not specifically. The first one is, well, he says so. I'm always amazed that people think and follow someone who says they found out that the world's going to end tomorrow at this time and when this blood moon comes or whatever. Come on, man. He says it time and time again. He doesn't know. He has, the son doesn't know, at least in his humanity doesn't know. And you are not to know. So stop trying to figure it out. That's not really the goal. Second thing is, the only benefit of knowing the end is coming is to the extent to which it is a motivation for being a better disciple now. So if the, if the world's going to end in 30 minutes, what should you do right now? Evangelize. Tell people about Jesus. Call them into the feast. If it's going to end in a thousand years, what should you do right now? Call them into the feast. Evangelize. So the end is not... So, the end is not... The purpose of it is not to do anything except for to drive you to be more obedient to the mission. That's the point. When you get caught... I remember I spoke to... I had a man years ago. I don't, he may even be not with us any longer, uh, but not at this church. He once said he wanted to preach at my church, at our church, because he wanted to talk about the blood moons because the world was going to end September 27th, 2013. It didn't. Um, but he wanted to preach about that. And I said, that will never, ever happen as long as I'm pastor here. But then he said, but I've talked about this at our Bible study at the seniors residence for the last two years. And I said, shame on you. These people are struggling. So many of them are struggling. They're lonely. They're dying. There's, there's hope. There's good things, of course, too. But there's also needs. And you're looking up at the sky and saying, did you see the constellation tomorrow? Come on. Preach the gospel. Tell them there's hope in Christ. That's the point. And the third thing is this. If you and I knew the date and time exactly, do you think it would help? I, I, I used this example. I was talking to Sarah this morning. Today, for the first time, I don't know how long, I didn't have to be here early like super early. So because our family all knew we didn't have to be here early, no one was awake. <laughs> None. They knew exactly when we had to be here, and it didn't cause us to be more urgent because we knew the end. It caused me to be there, and Sarah bugged me because I'm like, 30 minutes, 25 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm yelling at the kids, right? Get ready, we're going to leave, we're going to leave. The end made no difference. In fact, if knowing the end causes us to become uh, dominated by the, ty the tyranny of the urgent, let me use an example. This summer, we had a problem with our roof. We had to fix it. And the leak was, it was happening. There's a leak happening. Things are getting wet. The tyranny of that urgent one moment meant I had to push everything else aside. I had to stop thinking about Christmas and sounds of Christmas, 
Stop thinking about evangelism to an extent because that's down there. That's happening down there. If Christ is going to come back in two years, I can deal with that later. Right now, I have to deal with this. So knowing the end time did not make me more urgent. It actually made me much less, less diligent. And so the question here is one of urgency versus anxiety. Knowing that the end is coming but not knowing when can cause anxiety. But if it causes you anxiety that it's probably because you've forgotten the gospel. Because the gospel says the end is going to come. Sure as God made little roses. It's going to come. But because you're a Christian, you know the judgment is good for you because of what Christ did. And so you can all at once be urgent knowing the end is coming and you have to call people into the feast. But you can also not have anxiety because you know if the end comes, it is well with my soul. And so knowing the times is important, but it cannot become a distraction. And Christ makes that clear. So don't get caught up with dates and times. If you see somebody who writes a book and it's got explosions on the cover and it, it tells you that they've unlocked the secret to the ending, throw it in the garbage. That's all I can tell you. Does that make me uncomfortable? Maybe people who don't like that. Okay, don't throw it. Don't burn it because I don't believe in burning books, but don't buy it either. How's that? So that's the first thing. Second thing, he then they say, well, you restore, is it now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And this is, this is interesting, see, because ancient Israel at the time, nobody, no Jew d- doubted that God was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They knew it would be a Jewish kingdom, that Israel would somehow grow and expand and be led. What they didn't know was, and what they debated about a lot, was what are we going to do with the Gentiles? Some said, we've got to kill them all. They don't belong here. They're not God's people. We have to kill them. Others said, no, no, we have to accept them when they come, because that's what the prophets seem to be, excuse me, seem to be saying. But then Christ shows up, and that's what they're wondering, right? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Christ comes and says, yes, but, what does he say? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So, the kingdom people, God's people, will neither kill the Gentiles, nor passively accept them. They are called to go out and gather them, which is radically different. You're not there just to, ca- to get the few who will answer uh, the call, the, like the general call. No, you're supposed to go out and mobilize them and get them. But here's a corrective for us Christians. Notice it says that it's going to begin in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. There's, we, as the church, have not replaced Israel. Israel is Israel. We are guests of honor at the table of Israel. Israel continues to be the people of God, and God says, I have now opened the doors to welcome other in. We have not replaced them. There's some, and there's some very popular teachers who will say, no, no, now what has to happen is Israel needs to be grafted into the church. My friends, that's, Scripture does not say that. Scripture says Israel is God's people, and by grace he has opened the door and says, I'm going to let Gentiles in. And that is so vitally important to what we believe. And if you don't use that old parable, I've mentioned it a couple times a little, the wedding feast in Matthew 22. There's this king, and he says, I'm going to have a feast. I'm going to invite all the invited guests. Symbolism is clear. It's Israel. God's inviting Israel to the feast, but not all of them accept. So he then says, fine, the ones who didn't accept, I can't do anything for them. So instead, go out in the streets now and gather the many that you find and invite them in. You and I, unless you're a Jew who's converted and become Messianic Jew, you and I are the many that were gathered and brought into the feast prepared for Israel, for God's people. And so we must never forget that. I remember Victor Shepherd was here preaching, and this wonderful old pastor, one preacher, preacher said to me, um, Jesus is nothing to you if he is not the Jewish Messiah. And he's right. And so we need to remember that Israel is now, it's hard for Israel to hear because they're being busted open now and the whole world is welcome. And at the same time, we need to remember, you and I have not replaced Israel. We have been grafted in to the blessing promised Israel. And so this is, what he is saying here in part. And Acts, again, as I said, is so relentless in telling us that the task of the church is this. You and I, now with invitations to the feast, are called to go out and gather more people into the feast constantly, over and over. It's important to go and do mercy ministries. You're going to see that in the book of Acts. But it's interesting that at the beginning here, he doesn't mention that. It says, mission, that's your job. Tell people about Christ. That's your job, first and foremost. And so John Stott says this, a bit lengthy, but it's worth it. The kingdom of God is his rule set up in the lives of his people by the Holy Spirit. It is spread by witness, not by soldiers. 
through a gospel of peace, not a declaration of war, and by the work of the Spirit, not by force of arms, political intrigue, or revolutionary violence. At the same time, in rejecting the politicizing of the kingdom, we must be aware of the opposite extreme of super-spiritualizing it, as if God's rule operates only in heaven and not on earth. The fact is that although it must not be identified with any political ideology or program, it has radical political and social implications. Kingdom values come into collision with secular values, and the citizens of, of God's kingdom steadfastly deny to Caesar the supreme loyalty for which he hungers, but which they insist on giving to Jesus alone. And so we are called to be a people set apart from the world. If you are always being accepted by the world, then you have to ask if you're actually a Christian or if you're promoting that Christianity, if you're speaking, but if you're espousing it because the world is necessarily opposed to it. When we're called to be salt and light in the world, salt does a lot of things, and I've preached on this before. Salt preserves the good. So we go into the world and we say, there's good here. In schools and in medical situations or in workplaces, there's good to want to help and to heal and to nurture, and we preserve the good. But salt also irritates, and occasionally we're going to rub salt into the wounds of the culture and say, but you've missed the mark here. And if you're not doing both, then you need to ask why. And so we are called to be this sort of a people. Living, live as, living as kingdom people necessarily puts us at odds with the world. But we engage as witnesses, never as soldiers. We are never called to kill for the kingdom, but we are called to die for it. Healthy Christians will share the gospel. That's simple. So what are we to know what the kingdom is, what it's about, what's the rules, how do we get there, how do we nurture it, how do we, how do we partner with God in producing and bringing about kingdom renewal here? And then what do we do is we do that work, primarily in calling people to repent. And then how can we do it? So how do we do it? Right? Because it's pretty hard. How do you strategically do this? And how do you maintain the message? Because there's the dual parts of mission, going out and winning the lost as best we can, but also maintaining a message that is true and not just watering down the message and not just making up our own message. And so how do you do both? Well, the fact is you cannot do it by yourself. And this is why God, from the beginning, has had a plan in place. And Jesus outlines it so well here. It's so subtle you may not even know it. But when he, when he says to the disciples, listen, God has a plan. You're going to be able to do this only because of his Holy Spirit. It's the only possible way. And this is not a new plan coming in the book of Acts. It's been happening since the beginning. And he says, you, he says, you sit here, you sit in Jerusalem until you receive the Father's promise, which indicates in the Old Testament, God spoke about it. And this is like in places in Joel, when you hear that the kingdom of God is going to come. And when the Messiah comes, he'll bring the kingdom. And then he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Those three things happen together in the prophets. Messiah, kingdom, spirit. And he's saying, this has been talked about. You heard the, pro the Father say it. He then says, you heard me say it. And if you read Luke 12, John 16, you hear Jesus talk about this exact thing where the Spirit will come and make it possible for us to be these kingdom people. And then he says, and you heard it from John. John the Baptist said he baptizes with water, but one will come who he's not even worthy to tie the laces of who will baptize with fire. And he says, that was me, that was the Spirit. So you've heard this before, that was the plan, and now you are seeing it happening. And this is when the Spirit then comes at Pentecost, which we'll talk about when we get there. And he says, look at what he says, though. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come to you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem. See? See the order? First you'll receive the Spirit, then you will be a witness. Because without the Spirit, you will not be the witness you need to be. Israel could not fulfill what they were called to do because they didn't have, well, they had no faith, they had no Spirit, all lots of things. And he says, this, to remedy this, I am now sending my Spirit, and he's going to dwell in you. And this is so important, because remember that scene in, after the resurrection when Mary grabs onto Jesus when she sees him? And he says famously, do not hold on to me, right? Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Mary, when you grab onto me, you miss me as the guy who's been with you for the last three years, and you're holding on because you don't want to lose me again. So what you're holding on to is a certain kind of relationship with me. But if you hold on to me like that, you won't get what's better, which is what he says in John 16 when he says, it's good for me to go. Because if I go, that means the comforter will come. The spirit will come. And when in the book of Acts, when he ascends, there's one pastor who says, that's the detonator for the Holy Spirit. What happens is he goes up and he is no longer, Christ is no longer limited to his only being where his physical body is. But now he comes and he can dwell in the hearts of his people. 
and it explodes. It democratizes the spirit. So it's no longer the the safekeeping of one or two or in the Old Testament where God would give it to a judge or give it to Saul as needed. Instead, now, every believer has this. Every believer has the spirit. And it's so mind-boggling. I don't know if we realize that if Moses was to know, I mean, I assume he knows, but imagine you pull this character, Moses, out of the Bible and he doesn't know what's happened. And then you tell him, hey, the Holy Spirit now dwells in us, no longer in the tabernacle, no longer in the temple, but in his, the people of God. Moses would probably say, are you kidding me? I was like threatened with death. I saw people die because they went near the mountain that the Spirit was on. And you get to have him in your heart? What? That's awesome. It's incredible. Of course, we don't realize that. But this is the awe and the greatness of what's happened. And the only way we are ever going to be the kingdom people, that redeemer individually, is if we have the Holy Spirit. And I know some churches don't talk often about it, but we, we have to. The only way you're ever going to be the sort of person that you're going to see outlined in the book of Acts is if you have the Holy Spirit. And that's why we exist. We exist as a church for mission. It's not like the church exists and then it has one part of it as mission. No, the church was literally formed for the sake of mission. It was formed so that others can be drawn in. And that needs to be, we have to remember that. And we have to reorient everything we do towards, not, towards reaching the lost. But remember, to make someone capable of being a healthy disciple and replicating the faith, you have to make them healthy. And sometimes that means working through addictions and baggage and all sorts of things in us. So we heal the spirit. We heal the body here. But always with the intent of radically calling you in to radically send you out. That's always the goal, because that's what healthy things do. And that's one of the things we're trying to do here, not perfectly, of course, but it is something we try to do. And Acts tells us that we have the orders, which is the Great Commission. We have the motivation, which is grace. When you see, again, that you didn't deserve anything, but you've received everything because of Christ, it becomes a pleasure and a joy to reach. It becomes a pleasure to do what Phyllis was doing and helping out here at 95 years old. And it's not to lift her up. This is... It should be ordinary. That should be the ordinary posture of a Christian because we're so overwhelmed by the grace that we've received. And then, of course, we're not just given the commission and the motivation, but then we're given the power, the spirit that allows us to accomplish what we could never accomplish on our own. That's Acts 1, and we have much more to say as we go forward. So let me pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for this mission, Father. Um, it's, it's humbling. It's rem- hard to remember because it's so easy for us to think that the, that the challenges that come in the church, we want to, it's easier for us to cocoon. It's easier for us to say, the world is going to heck in a handbasket. Let it go. Let's just worry about in the church. Let's just nurture our people. And yet, you didn't call us to that. You didn't call us to be a, a, an insular people. You didn't call us to just tuck in and protect the faith. You called us to protect the faith and go out and share the faith. And um, that means we're going to be treated like you. Sometimes we'll be hated Sometimes we'll be welcomed. Some people will accept the invitation. Others will spit on us. In fact, that wedding feast parable says that some of them killed the messengers. And so we know, Lord, that um, we bear a message that it's all at once the most glorious truth that anyone could hear, but also the most despised truth that any sinner hears. Because like Psalm 2 says, we, we say, we, we, we conspire against the Lord. We say, cast his yoke from off our neck. We don't want to be led. So, Father, I pray that by your spirit you would help us to be a church that models the joy and peace and newness and renewal and restoration that comes with the gospel, that we look differently from the world, not for our glory, but for yours. And I also pray that we would be people who would think deeply and strategize well and use our resources well and our time well to figure out how can we call more people into the saving grace of your son. Lord, it's difficult, yet it's the mandate you've given us, and we revel in it, we rejoice in it, We thank you that you have a message of hope for our hopeless world. Father, we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.